Thank you, Divya. Thank you all for being here. I hope you're having a good time so far. So let me introduce myself. Uh, hi, my name is Leah. If you've ever heard that name before, it's because of one of my open source projects. Some of them are listed here. I work at W3C in developer relations. Uh, I'm also in the CSS working group and I'm editing CSS backgrounds and borders level four. So you might be wondering, what's this another 10 CSS secrets in the title? Uh, why is it another? What about the first ones? So the, that part comes from my first talk, uh, well, not my first one, my, in this uh, series. So it was called CSS3 Secrets, 10 Things You Might Not Know About CSS3. I used to give it in 2011 and early 2012. And it presented people 10 things that maybe they didn't know about CSS3. And let me go over these secrets quickly. So can you hear me? Hello? OK. So the first one was how you can get bouncing transitions by using cubic Bezier values out of the 0, 1 range. Uh, a bouncing transition is something like this. The second one was how you can get flexible ellipses by using percentage-based border radius, border radius 50%. Um, the third one was how you can fake the effect of having multiple outlines by using multiple box shadows with uh, positive spread radius and no blur. Fourth one was how you can make pointer events pass through, which means uh, make elements ignore mouse clicks and hovers by using the, the property pointer events none. The fifth one was how you can adjust tab size so that you don't have this awful tab width of eight characters. How many of you are tab people and hate spaces for indentation? Hmm, a few. Well, I don't like spaces for indentation. I like tabs, so I love that property, tab size. Uh, the sixth one was how you can style elements based on how many siblings they have. Uh, not just siblings before them, which is easy, siblings both before and after them, the total number of siblings they have. And you can do that by combining first child with nth last child and the adjacent sibling selector. Uh, the, four, the seventh one was how you can have custom checkboxes and radio buttons by using the checked pseudo class and pseudo elements on, on their label. The eighth one was how, uh, uh, how CSS3 UI gives us more cursors that we can take advantage of to improve UX in our apps. Uh, sixth one was how you can take advantage of gradients to make background patterns with pure CSS. And the, the tenth one was how you can uh, position backgrounds uh, on like the bottom right corner and have them follow the padding instead of being stuck on the bottom right corner. And the way you can do that is by using background origin. So I know I went through them in very quickly here, but you can look that video up. There are many videos of this talk if you're interested. So what is this talk? This talk is kind of like a sequel to that first one. And sequels are challenging. So. I know that, for example, in film history, there are many sequels that have been much worse than the first one, and it was a big challenge to try to do this talk, but I'm hoping it will be more like the first Star Wars sequels, which were very good, and not the last ones, which were, which were kind of terrible. So let's start with the first one. This is a screenshot of my Google Reader, and this is my Google Reader in action. So why am I showing you my Google Reader? Uh, it's because Google Reader has this nice effect here in the sidebar. So when you scroll down, you can see that it shows you this nice shadow, which indicates that you can scroll up and there's more content. And yes, you have the scroll bar, but this is a nice extra effect. And it has the same thing at the bottom. Now it doesn't have a shadow, but if I scroll up, you can see that a shadow just appeared. So Google is, is using JavaScript to achieve this, but you can actually achieve that with pure CSS. But before we go into this, let me talk about background attachment. You might be wondering, why is she talking about background attachment? What is there to know about background attachment? Come on, that's one of the most basic CSS properties. And yes, the two first values, scroll and fixed, are two values you all know. When you have scroll and you scroll through the element, 
The background stays at the same place. When you, when you scroll the page itself, it moves. Fixed, on the other hand, the background stays on the same place regardless of what you're doing, whether you're scrolling the page or whether you're scrolling the element itself. So have you noticed what's missing here? We don't have a value that lets the background scroll when you're scrolling the element itself. In both cases, it stays at, it stays at the same place. And that's why backgrounds and borders three introduced a new value, background attachment local. So with background attachment local, when you scroll the page, it behaves the same way as background attachment scroll. But when you scroll the element itself, the background sc scrolls as well. Let me summarize this with a table here. So for a while, I used to wonder why this value was added. What are the use cases? I mean, sure, it sounds like something that was missing, but do we really need it? And eventually, I found a use case for it, and I think it becomes very useful. So let me show you how you can create this effect uh, step by step. So first, we need to add the shadow. And I'll use a gradient for that, because box shadow would produce a, a, a shadow that doesn't look the way we want. So I'll use a radial gradient. Its center will be at the top, uh, at the middle top corner. So it will be at 50% horizontally and zero vertically. And let's start with something that goes from black to transparent. And this will be very intense, but we'll fix it. So let's adjust background size first and make it smaller. We want it to be 100% horizontally and something like 15 pixels vertically. And let's cancel background repeat because we don't want this shadow to be repeated. So it starts to look like a shadow, but it's a bit too intense. So let's fix that. Let's move the, col the color stop for transparent a bit earlier. And let's make this semi-transparent black instead of pure black. So now it starts looking more like a shadow. Let's make it even more subtle. So this looks more like what Google Reader has. But if you scroll the element, the shadow scro doesn't scroll, it stays at the same place, because that's how background attachment scroll behaves. However, if you add background attachment local, now you can only see it at the top. And you can add another radial gradient at the bottom to simulate the bottom shadow. It has a different center and a different background position and it shares all the other properties. It's the same background size, no repeat, and background attachment local. So there you go. The difference is that the Google Reader shadow is more smooth when you scroll. This just scrolls with the element. The Google Reader shadow is more smoothly revealed. So what you can do is you can use linear gradients to mask the shadow, and the linear gradients would have a local background, so when you're scrolled up, they would obscure the shadow, but the shadows themselves would have a, a, scroll back, a scroll background attachment. So when you scroll uh, down, the gradients would mask them, but when you scroll up, they wouldn't. So I'm not sure if you can see the difference in the projector, but the way it's revealed is much more smooth. But if you just want the basic effect, it's much simpler to just use two gradients and background attachment local. So what's the browser support for this? Well. Background attachment local has pretty good browser support, except Firefox. It's supported by pretty much every other browser in use today. Well, IEA doesn't support it, but eh, what do you expect? Um, and CSS gradients are supported by i10 and all our other browsers in use today. Uh, but you don't really need CSS gradients for this technique to work. You can just use background images. The main secret behind this technique is background attachment local. That's all you need. The shadow could just be a gradient, and you can make it any way you want if you use a, uh, a background image instead of a gradient. So the caveat of the second technique is that it requires a solid background. In the first one, where you don't use gradients to mask the shadow, uh, background could be anything. And I should credit Roman Komarov for this technique. He came up with the first, first version where he used pseudo elements and not background attachment local. And then I suggested we could use background attachment local to make it simpler in, instead of needing pseudo elements. So let's go to the second one. I'm sure you've seen this effect many times in websites. 
it became quite fashionable like one or two years ago, maybe longer, where you have fixed, co fixed width content but fluid width background. So the background occupies the entire width of the viewport, but the content always stays at a fixed width. And usually, this is implemented in this way. You need a wrapper element for the background and another one for the content. And the code usually looks something like this. You have a wrapper element with a fixed width and margin auto, so it's centered in its container. However, if you th think about it for a second, what exactly is margin auto? What does it do? It takes the space you have available, it subtracts, in this case, the width of 700 pixels that you have, and it divides it by two. So it's basically equivalent to this if we use the calc function. But if we look at this for a second, we can substitute the margin on the child with a padding in the container. So if we do that, we're just left with CSS on the container. We don't need the inner element anymore. So let's see this in action. We can have calc 50% minus 350 pixels, and it works, and we don't need an, an extra element anymore. It's just the sections. Unfortunately, browser support for calc is not perfect. i9 supports it, and actually it supports it without a prefix. But it's not supported by Opera. Uh, I should mention, when I use Opera in these compatibility tables, I mean Presto, I don't mean the new Opera with WebKit because it's not released yet. Opera has recently announced that they're moving to WebKit. But uh, the Operas that people still have still use Presto, so that's what I'm using in these compatibility tables. So basically, Calc is supported by most browsers in use today, except Opera and IE8. Of course. There is a hacky way to do it with CSS 2.1. I wouldn't advise you use it, because it stinks. It's very hacky, but I'll show it anyway. So you can have a very large negative margin vertically, something that looks like this, and then you cancel it with a very large equal padding. And it works but it's very hacky. Ew. So let's go to the third one. Here you have this image, and when I hit my keyboard arrow keys, it gets a class of current, and it grows bigger. And this code is applied to it, transition one second, which means uh, it tells the browser every property you can transition with CSS transitions, you should transition it, and it should last one second. What we were going for in this case was something that looks like a light box. How many of you know what, a, know what a light box is? Pretty much all of you. So if you remember, a light box usually doesn't grow like this. The width doesn't grow along with the height. It usually spreads vertically and then opens horizontally. So you get the height first and the width afterwards. So can we do this with CSS transitions, or do we need to use something more complicated like CSS animations or JavaScript? Actually, we can do it with CSS transitions, and it's very simple. We just need to know three extra things about CSS transitions. One of them is that you can transition, you can restrict the transitions based on which property they apply to. So here I've restricted the transition based on height. So now the height will be transitioned, but the width isn't. So the width just jumps to the end width, but the height smoothly transitions over one second. If I put width here, the opposite happens. The width transitions, but not the height. The second thing is that you can delay transitions. So here I've delayed the transition by one second, and you will see that now the height just jumps straight at the end goal, but the width takes a second to start transitioning, and then another second to completely unfold. Both of these does, don't seem very useful, but they will very soon when I tell you the third thing. And that is that you can chain multiple transitions with different parameters. So you can have a one second height transition, and then 
a, a one second width transition that's delayed by one second. And what does that mean? It means that you, get, you essentially get the light box kind of transition, first height, then width. And this is how it looks, which is very close to what we wanted, but I don't like the way it closes. It opens in the way we wanted, but it doesn't close in that way. When you, because when it closes, you also get first width, then height. But what we wanted is that the transition should be reversed when it closes. So how can we do that? We can specify different transitions for when it closes and when it opens. So let's try doing that. We'll just copy the transition over and reverse the order of the properties. The other way. So you get first height, then width when it opens. And yeah, so let's see how it looks. So now it both opens and closes in exactly the way we expect the light box to work. And is this practical in the real world? I've actually used this in the webplatform.org homepage. If you click on this to see the video, that's what's behind this. And actually, the overlay here that you see that, that has dimmed the, the page on the back, that's also part of the transition. It's a box shadow. It's just a box shadow with a huge blur, uh, with a huge uh, spread radius, which covers the entire screen. And it's also part of the transition. On IE8, it still works. You just don't see a transition, which I think is com completely acceptable since IE8 on, and below only has 15% uh, today, of usage today, and in technical websites like webplatform.org, it's even lower. So the browser support for transitions is i 10 and every other browser. And let's go to the fourth one. So I'm sure you've seen many uh, you, I'm sure you've seen a lined paper effect many times before, so you might be wondering why I'm showing you this here. So yes, this is a lined paper effect, uh, but it's special. And why is it special? Because when I change the font size, it adapts. Regardless of what font size I have, it will adapt to match it. And same goes with the padding. It will adapt to match both the padding and the font size. The only thing it can't adapt is the line height because when you specify it, you have to duplicate the line height as you'll see right now. So I use a linear gradient as a background image. Let's make it black at first so that you can see it more clearly. And right now you can't see it because it's just a one pixel line somewhere at the top. But I, will, I need to change the background size to make it as high as every line. And how do I do that? I specify the background size in M's. And I will need to set background position somewhere like something like this you display it by the eye um, that looks okay so now this will adapt to our font size because it's set in M's so every time I increase the font size all of these adapt as well but it won't adapt to changes in padding because there's nothing in this code that depends on the padding. So how can we do that? We can use background origin. What this line of code does is that it, it tells the browser to start placing 
the background from the content box, which is the box inside the padding. You get the border box, which includes the border. You get the padding box, that includes your padding. And the content box is the inner box, the, the box around your content. So we need to adapt this, of course. That looks OK. And now, because this is, re this is relative to the padding, if I change the padding, it will work. And of course, I can make this less intense by using some semi-transparent black instead of pure black, something like this. A similar effect is when you want every line, when you want every second line to have a, a, a specific color. For example, when you have a table, it's very easy these days to create zebra tables where every line, every other line has a certain color because you can use nth child. But you can't do the same thing with lines, with text lines, because we don't have any pseudo element or any cla pseudo class or anything for lines. However, you can fake it by using something similar. So the colors I'm using are pretty random, beige 50% and white 50%. So this gradient now occupies the entire height of our element, so we, only, we see 50% of the entire element being colored beige, and the other 50% being colored white, which is not very useful in this case. So background size to the rescue again. The horizontal width doesn't matter as long as it's not zero. It's the vertical width that makes the difference. So here we have line height 1.5, and every tile of this background needs to be two lines. It needs to, be as, it needs to have the same height as two lines of text, so, which means 3M. And background origin again, So, because as, as you can see, now every tile of this background has the same height as lines but it's a bit misplaced, and it's misplaced because we have padding. So if we use background origin, this is fixed, and we don't even need to use background position. So as you can see, this follows the font size, and we can even change the font size. I think it's 50% in this demo. We can make it bigger or smaller, anything we want, and it will follow it. And same with padding. So browser support for linear gradients is every browser in use today and I-10. So basically, the only problem is I-9 and below. But you don't really need gradients for this. Just like the, the, the first example, you can use regular bitmap background images or SVG background images, so it will work in I-9 as well. Uh, the, the main thing here is using background size in M's and background origin, and these two things are supported by I9 as well. So it should be fine in like 85% of your users at least. And for in browsers that don't support it, you just get a uh, any you can specify any fallback background you want. So let's go to the fifth one. Here we have a div with a rhombus as a background. And think about it for a second. How would you go about doing this kind of thing? Many of you would suggest we do it with pseudo elements. But until recently, we couldn't animate pseudo elements, so we wouldn't be able to do this sort of thing. So another way to do this would be to use an extra HTML element and do this. Wait. We specify a rotate transform. And then, on the inner element, we cancel it with a minus 45 degree transform. So, the outer element is rotated, and the, the content inside is, and so you can read it without turning your head around. And this is a quite simple example, but if you use this technique, you can do many cool stuff. Like, for instance, 
David Story used this, uh, a variant of this technique to make this sort of thing. Well, well, he's applying skew transforms and cancelling them on the inner elements. And I've used something similar to do this, uh, where this one is just two HTML elements. I can show you the HTML code behind it. It's just this. And I've used something like this technique, basically a transform here, which I'm cancelling it here. And I've managed to crop this image to a hexagon shape. The caveat is that it acquires an extra HTML element, which might bother some of you. And CSS transforms are, include, are, are supported in every browser, including IE9, and yeah, every browser, most browsers in use today. So let's go to the sixth one. So uh, about a year or two ago, Chris Coyer of CSSTricks.com came to me and with a CSS problem because he knows I like CSS challenges. And he was like, how can we animate a CSS element on a circle without having the element itself rotate like the way this smiley does? And Back then, we couldn't think of anything. Uh, so we concluded that the only way was to specify tons of keyframes so you can kind of approximate a circle. But as time went by, I had this challenge at the back of my head, and eventually I found a solution, which I'm going to show you now. So we have a simple keyframe-based animation from zero degrees to 360 degrees. And let's try applying it. So as you can see, even if I cancel the acceleration, this simple animation makes the element turn around itself, which isn't particularly useful for what we want. We can specify a transform origin, which is like the center of the circle here. Like 50% horizontally and something like 370 to the bottom, which makes it turn around that circle. But that's still not what we need. Because the smiley rotates around the circle, but it also rotates around itself, which we don't want. However, we can apply a variant of the technique I showed you before, and we can cancel. We can specify two different transforms that cancel each other. The problem with that is we need two HTML elements. So here I have the same smiley, but instead of uh, having just one element, it also has an Im uh, the image and a div around the image. So the first step is specifying an opposite keyframe animation, anti-clockwise, which goes from 360 to 0. And the first one goes from 0 to 360. So we copy this animation over, and we change the animation name. And now we got what we wanted. It's a bit messy, but it works. One of, the, one of the two transforms has a transform origin, the other one doesn't. So basically, it rotates around the circle, and then it has an opposite rotation around itself. So these two cancel each other, and you only see the movement. You can tidy up the code a bit and group these together so you only override the animation name, which means you can, for example, change the duration in one go. But it's still a bit messy. Um, so CSS animations are supported by, they have decent browser support, not perfect, but decent. Uh, but that code was quite messy. You can tidy up, you can tidy up, uh, tidy it, uh, it up a bit by using only one keyframe based animation and using animation direction reverse to kind of generate the second one. 
What animation direction reverse does is that it takes every iteration and it reverses it. So you get uh, this animation on the image inside the div. This is the markup behind this smiley, a div and an image inside it. So you get this animation on the image, but on the, on the div around it, you use animation direction reverse so that you reverse the animation and you don't need to specify a second one. But I still don't like this because you need two HTML elements, which is not the end of the world, but can we do better? Actually, we can do better. Uh, yeah, animation direction reverse doesn't have, has a little bit worse browser support but, than CSS animations in general, but not that much worse. So here is how we can do better. It, and it's a little, it's a bit difficult to explain how this works because it took me like months to understand it. I didn't come up with it. Aria Gregor did. He is someone in the CSS working group which said it's the CSS transform spec. Uh, so the way this works is try to picture it frame by frame. Don't look at the animation in its entirety. Uh, try to picture how it, wo how it works on every frame. So you get, on every frame, you get a rotation by some degrees. It starts from zero and it goes to 360. Then you translate by a fixed amount. It's the same amount, it's the same uh, length of pixels in every frame. And then you rotate back by the opposite amount uh, of degrees. So it starts from zero and zero and it goes to 360 and minus 360. So these, on every frame, the degrees are opposite. There are the same amount of degrees but opposite. So you don't see any rotation of the smiley. But you do see the movement because every transform changes the coordinate system itself. So the translate that's applied af after the first rotation means that the smiley is rotated according to that rotation. So, yeah, the, I, and the good thing about this is that even though it has less code and it doesn't need an extra HTML element, it has even better browser support than the previous one I showed. It's basically supported by every browser that supports CSS animations. This is the guy that came up with it. He's very smart. So let's go to the seventh one. Here is a speech bubble. It's using a pseudo element to generate this pointer, but this secret is not about how you can use pseudo element to generate pointer. I guess most of you know that. It's about something else. So let's suppose we want to apply a box shadow to this. We go about, uh, we start writing a pretty common box shadow. Let's increase the blur radius. Do you see the problem with this? Even though it works fine for most of the speech bubble, this part is not shadowed. And it kind of looks unnatural. Instead of making it look more real, it makes it look more fake. So what can we do about it? Not much in most browsers, but CSS filter effects lets us do this. Same parameters as the box shadow. And the good thing about uh, CSS filters is that the filter is, is cast on the element and every transparent region in the element, whether it's because of a background or because of some weird border effect or anything, is shadowed as well. So it will be what you expect. In most cases, in some others it won't be. Like, here, for example, let's apply a shadow. Box shadow looks terrible. As you can see, it's not following the dotted border. And let's, so let's try filter effects. Every transparent region is shadowed, which might or might not be what you expect, because this shadow on the text makes it even harder to read. And some people would suggest we use a text shadow none to cancel it, but that won't work because it's completely separate. In fact, if you use a text shadow, let's 
specify a white one. The, the text shadow is old, also has a drop shadow because of the filter. So if I move this shadow, you can see it more clearly. The shadow is shadowed. Which is weird. But kind of expected. So CSS filter effects don't have very good browser support at the moment. Uh, they're supported by Chrome and Safari, even on the iPhone. And you can kind of get them working on Firefox, but not exactly. The thing is, Firefox supports SVG filters on HTML content, but not with that nice syntax I just showed you. For Firefox, if you want to get them working on Firefox, you have to use an extra SVG file, specify the filter in SVG, and then you have to use the standard SVG syntax to link it to your element. You can use these two syntaxes alongside. So here I've used a drop shadow for Firefox and one for WebKit. And what I usually do in these cases is that I, uh, I specify a, an SVG file that has something like what I want. And then I use the same SVG file anywhere, and maybe I'll tweak a, the, the WebKit parameters a bit, but I won't create multiple SVG files. It's just not worth it. So the eighth one is also about, uh, about filters, but it's something a bit more complicated. So have you seen how in these uh, number uh, counters, I, uh, the image at the background is blurred? The, image behind the, the background image behind this is blurred, whereas this one is not. So how can we create this effect? Our first thought might be something like this. We have a blur filter. Let's use it. No, that's not what we wanted, is it? This makes it harder to read, not easier. So what can we do? We, it's a little bit hacky. Let's use a before pseudo element. We specify a content of, empty, of the empty string. Position absolute. Glass pane already has position relative. It's just not displayed in this code area. Let's give top right, bottom, and left an offset of zero so that it occupies the entire element. Let's apply a background red at the moment to see what we've done so far. So this pseudo element is above our content, which doesn't help so much. So let's change this by using Z index minus one, which brings the pseudo element behind our content. Can we use blur now? Let's try it. Nope. And the reason why we can't is that we just have a transparent element and that's the only thing that's blurred. The background is not blurred when you use a blur filter. The foreground is not, it's just that, 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 whatever you're applying the blur filter to, which in this case is just a transparent pseudo element. What we need to do to blur the background is duplicate the background on the pseudo element and blur that. In this case, it's easy because the background has a fixed position and a background size of cover, so it's easier to duplicate it. In other cases, it would be harder. So let's try to do this. Same background position as whatever we have on the slide and fixed, and the same background size cover. So now we've managed to match the background on the, on the slide. And even if we resize this, it would still match, which is what we wanted. And now, after all this, we can finally blur. And it will work. And even if I resize this, it will work as expected. Usually in web design, we had to duplicate our background uh, image and blur it on like Photoshop and do this thing. We usually did the exact same thing, but we had to blur the element on Photoshop and use two images. We still have to use the same hacky way right now, 
but at least we don't have to duplicate the, the background image and have an extra HTTP request and two images and all that. Of course, that comes at a cost, and the cost is uh, worse browser support. It has its caveats. Uh, on some cases, it will be harder to apply, but you have the same caveats even if you, if, even if you use the traditional way of creating that effect. Uh, this is not very relevant to what I showed you, but it's relevant to blur filters. It's a nice effect uh, that Hakim El Khattab created. Um, he blurs the background when you open a uh, model dialog, which helps creating an illusion of depth. And CSS filter support is the same as the drop shadow filter I showed earlier. Uh, Chrome, Safari, and kind of Firefox if you use an SVG file. The good thing is that the SVG file in this case is much simpler because there's a filter primitive for blurring. So for the ninth one, I'll switch to Firefox because what I've just showed will not work on Chrome. It will work on Safari, but not Chrome. So here we have some justified text, which doesn't look very nice. And for those of you who are kind of designery or web designers or designers in general, probably already know why it doesn't look nice. It's because of all these rivers of white space between the words. It's hard to read and it's ugly. Magazines use justified text all the time, but it doesn't look like this. The reason is that they use hyphenation, which makes the text look more even. For years, it was very complex to have hyphenation in browsers. We had to use server-side scripts or client-side scripts, and it wasn't easy. However, CSS text uh, level three made this way, way easier than it used to be. The only thing you need is one line of CSS. Just this. Everything just works. Even if you have different languages than English, it still works. You just have to specify the language you're using in the HTML, obviously. Browser can guess. But it just works. It's that simple. And support for CSS hyphenation is not perfect. It's Safari, both in desktop and iOS. It's i10, and it's Firefox from version six. But the good thing is that it degrades quite gracefully. In browsers that don't support CSS hyphenation, your content is still accessible. People can still read it. It just won't have hyphenation until these browsers start supporting CSS hyphenation, which is not the end of the world. And the last secret I wanted to share with you has to do with animation. So here we have a PNG file called frames PNG with 10 frames of a frame by frame animation. And we have a div that uses that as a background. It also has a border just so that you can see that div, but I'll remove the border because it looks ugly. And I'll define a keyframe-based animation that goes from background position zero to minus 500, because if you notice this, I can, create, I can show different frames of the background image just by changing this. So it looks like I could maybe create a frame-by-frame -frame animation by using CSS animations. So let's try to do that. We can get to the last frame by using minus 500 since we have 10 frames and each one is 50 pixels wide. So let's try to do that. Oh, we need to give it a name too. So from background position zero, to background position minus 500 and zero. 
let's apply this animation. Wave, I want it to last two seconds maybe. And I want it to be repeated infinitely. So you can instantly see what's wrong with this. Even if we turn off acceleration by giving it an easing keyword of linear, it still doesn't exactly look what, like what we wanted. It's not even close. This doesn't look like a frame by frame animation. It looks like a, a mess. So what can we do to fix this? It's actually much simpler than it looks. <coughs> You can just use a, 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 an easing function of steps, which is not, um, if we say steps 10, for instance, you get no actual animation, no, progressively, no progressive change between the keyframes, just 10 steps. <coughs> and in this case, that's exactly what we wanted. We can even make this a little bit shorter in duration, which, so that it looks more natural. And you might be wondering, why do we need this sort of thing? Don't we have animated GIFs? <laughs> well, the thing is, animated GIFs don't have uh, alpha transparent backgrounds. You can only say that a pixel is either transparent completely or completely opaque. And in some cases, you need anti-aliasing or, in general, you need semi-transparent pixels, so a PNG makes more sense. And yes, there's this image format about animated PNGs, this APNG format, but actually, this technique has better browser support than APNG, strange as it may sound. Another little tip is that you don't actually need this keyframe at all, because it starts from zero, zero anyway, if you omit either the from or the to keyframe, it's, it gets automatically generated by the, bros, by the browser based on what you have here. So I can remove this, and it just works the same way. So it, it just needs one keyframe. <coughs> this exact animation, uh, it was Simurai that first came up with it. So credits to him. Browser support of steps is a little bit worse than it is for CSS animations in general, but not significantly. Actually, this is a mistake. It should be I-10, sorry. Um, so basically, it's I-10 and pretty much all the other browsers in use. And this is uh, a use case of steps that I came up with. You can use CSS animations to generate this kind of typing effect as if you're typing something on the console. I won't go in de over the code of that in detail, but it kind of looks like, it looks like this. Uh, you basically have an anim a keyframe animation for typing and one of the caret because the caret is blinking and you need an animation for that. Uh, so you specify two animations. The number of steps here is the number of characters you have. And you also, uh, you specify the end width, the end width uh, in four, uh, 24 characters. The CH unit is a new unit that, it corresponds to the width of the zero character in the font you're using, which is not very useful in most fonts, but it's very useful in monospace fonts, because in monospace fonts, the width of the zero character is the width of every character, because every character in the, in the font has the same width. So, since I'm using a monospace font here, I've specified the, the, the target width in 24 characters. And I've also specified a fallback in M's, which works, but not perfectly. And as you can see, I've used the same trick here as before. Uh, I've only specified one keyframe, and the others get generated by the browser. So here it goes from a width of zero, which means the entire text is obscured. It's, it's hidden, because I have overflow hidden. And it expands one step at a time until it reaches 24 characters. So every time uh, one step passes, you see one more character. So the CH unit um, was recently, it's supported by Firefox since version one, which is great. I10, 
And WebKit just very recently supported it. Uh, so it's not in a released in a stable version yet. This Chrome 27 is actually Chrome Canary. It's, it's still unstable, but it will go into WebKit very soon. So if you want to use the CH unit, you still need to provide fallbacks in EMS. And th this technique has a, the, the very big caveat that it needs a hard-coded character count. The good thing is that the character count is nowhere in the keyframes, so you can just set it uh, through the inline style. And of course, it doesn't work with multiple lines. You, you can't apply the same technique on, for example, a headline that has two lines or three lines or more. And since I've finished with all the 10 secrets, um, here is a total of how many browsers support how many features that were in this talk. So as you can see, most browsers are pretty much the same level these days. When I first made this talk, IE10 was actually the top, uh, but now they're more even. So that was it. And it's time for questions. Question everything. Don't be afraid. Thank you. I actually have a question about the first technique that you showed. Um, in Google Reader, the way that effect works is that the, there's no shadow when you're scrolled all the way to the top, and there is a shadow while you're in the middle, and it seems like the effect you created was actually the opposite. It's when you scroll, the shadow disappears. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions about how to achieve the Google Reader effect. Oh, actually, you're right. Yeah. See, this is why you shouldn't change presentations at the very last moment. <laughs> Um, yeah, the first version I had of that effect actually worked like Google Reader, and then I changed it. So, yeah, you can get it to work in the same way. Let's see. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So, let me see. Is the code still here? Oh, I typed it in Canary. So... Thanks for catching that, by the way. So here it was. Yeah, I did the exact opposite thing. And I was wondering why we used linear gradients. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Let me, do we have time? Yeah, we do, actually. We have seven minutes. So I'll just create it for the top shadow, and you can kind of Imagine how it will work for the other one. So let's add a linear gradient. I'll make it red so you can see what I'm doing and change the colors afterwards. Uh, let's make it like 50 pixels tall, high. And let's give it a background attachment of local where the other one will have scroll. So now when I, when I scroll to the top, it covers it. And let's make it white. So now when I'm at the top, it covers it. And when I, scroll to the, when I scroll down, it reveals a shadow. And I can actually make this like a real gradient so that it progressively uh, reveals a shadow because now it's quite abrupt. As you can see, it doesn't quite work the same way. But if I actually do it from white to semi-transparent white and play with the, with the color stop positions a bit, it will work much more smoothly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for catching that. Um, your which browser supported slides didn't mention Android support at all. Have you investigated that? Or? Um, and we now have Chrome on Android, but that's only the very newest Androids. Before that, we have Browser, which is an older WebKit. Are you interested in a certain feature in particular or in no, general? Just, just this general point that I've, I've seen this today a few times. There's, we've got the browser support markers and they're all desktop browsers, really. Well, yeah. Um, I think in, in most cases, Android support, uh, the, Android, the support of the Android browser is, uh, is obviously worse than Chrome and Safari and desktop, but it's improving. Um, well, it, it really depends on the feature you're talking about. 
but many of them are supported by the Android browser. Most of them, actually, I think. Go back to can I use, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should really add the Android browser in these. Quick comment among those lines. Um, I'm not 100% sure, so somebody with more knowledge might be better. But I think that an the current Android browser was branched off of Chrome 15 or 16. So anything that works at that point or earlier should work in Android, but anything that requires a later Chrome will not. Oh, good. Something good point. around there. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, there's another one. Another mobile related question, um, and I apologize if this comes off as confrontational, but do you ever consider performance? Um, I noticed some of the animations, even on your Mac, were um, Actually, going at a lower frame rate. Uh, the thing is, my Mac right now is, con is connected to a projector, and things always look more choppy on a projector. No, I mean, so, even between, like one of the smileys, even from when you no, change the technique, it looked like it got choppy. It wasn't choppy here. Until you, oh. uh, unless you mean while I was typing, and no. when I'm typing, the CSS keeps getting reapplied on every keystroke, which is why it looks choppy. It's not actually choppy. Uh, okay. And but animations always look bad on projectors. I should have mentioned that. Uh, okay. And then uh, a lot of times I notice when I'm looking at, you know, CSS spinners and things like that, I'll see 15 or 20% of a CPU used by the browser process when it's running the animation. Um, on mobile, that can be deadly. Well, almost always when you do something with CSS instead of using images, it will always... Uh, be a bit more heavy on the performance side, no matter how uh, performant you try to make it and no matter what you try to do. It, I mean, the browser has to generate it. When, when you're using images, it's pre-generated. It's obviously faster that way. But uh, in most cases, I don't, it, well, it could be deadly, but. Uh, well, so, some of them are. Some of them perform just fine. And others, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you can always test and see which ones you can use and which ones it's better to use images for. Thank you. Hello. Um, I just wanted to comment about the shadow scroller thing, and that's what I call it, I guess. I actually Im implemented this at Yelp recently, and uh, I did it in JavaScript first. And then I, uh, I was really proud of myself, like, oh, this is really cool. And I kind of Googled around to see if anyone else had built this before. And I came across all, the, like, your pages and the, the guy that you credited having done this in CSS. I was like, oh, I can just do it in CSS. That's way better. Um, and so I implemented CSS. And then I found out that there's kind of a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, like, considerations with CSS because it's a little, it's a little hacky to do it. For example, um, this really, this example really only works with black text um, in a black shadow because what's happening is the text is actually scrolling over the shadow, not under. Yes, so if you put an image yes, in there, that's all true. of a sudden it doesn't work. So I found that this component I had created was therefore not very re reusable in the sense that I couldn't really just put any kind of content in there. And so what I ended up doing is I, went, I dug up the commit that where I did it in JavaScript and, and reverted it, and now it's in JavaScript again. Um, and I think this kind of highlights a point, like a lot of these, these uh, demonstrations are really cool, but sometimes it's still, even though like we can do it in CSS, sometimes I think it's still better to do it in JavaScript, not only because it might be more flexible in terms of what you can do with it, but also I think for some developers it's more explicit when you're reading the code because some of these rely on just, uh, just lots and lots of like, just like cutting edge features. And like if I read this, it's not always clear what it's doing. And then I see it rendered on the screen like, oh, it works, that's cool. But that's another pro of doing it in JavaScript is maybe it's actually, it's actually better for, for developers just to understand what's going on. Well, you can always comment your CSS code in a way that makes it clear enough. Sure. Uh, and yes, some of these things are a bit hacky. And yes, that will not work uh, equally well if you have like uh, text that's a different color because yes, it's a background and the background is under the text and not over it as this makes it look. But it's useful in certain cases where you know that you're going to have black, black, black text and you, you know you're going to have black text on a white background or, or on another solid color background and you know it's, it's going to work. But n there's no technique that works in every possible use case. 
uh, you have to adapt. And that doesn't mean you, have, you necessarily have to use JavaScript, but even with CSS techniques, you often have to adapt the technique itself to work for your use case. And yes, if someone is, is more experienced in JavaScript uh, than in CSS, a JavaScript solution might be easier to understand, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Uh, it means that usually, peop it, mean, it means that someone might have, might be more proficient in JavaScript than in CSS, at least in modern CSS. Um, you can always comment your code and explain what you're doing, and you, you'll also teach the next developer something new that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for the great talk. So um. on that.